Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Pinak Shukla from California Orthopedics and Spine, California, United States. Dr. Shukla grew up in Chicago suburbs and attended the University of Illinois at Chicago for both undergrad and medical school, graduating from the latter with honors. Subsequently, he moved to Boston to complete his residency at the Tufts New England Medical Center, followed by a fellowship in arthroplasty at the University of California at San Francisco, United States. After practicing general orthopedics with an emphasis on joint replacement in Nebraska for six years, he's currently consultant in joint replacement attached to the California Orthopedics and Spine. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Pinak Shukla for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Pinak. Good morning, Dr. Gopalan. Thank you very much. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. And um, so today we're going to talk about <clears throat> some practical tips to ask tabular preparation for total hip arthroplasty. Um, <clears throat> it's a fun talk because you always come out of residency and you're wondering, you know, you know, even though you've had plenty of experience, to ask tabular can be rather uh, nerve wracking sometimes when you're first starting out. So I think this is a helpful talk and just try to make it practical um, for everybody. So no disclosures pertain to this talk. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about a few different things. Certainly anatomy, can't do surgery without anatomy. So anatomical landmarks, retractor placement, kind of go over the details of the reaming technique. Um, what's our target for a cut position? Uh, anatomic safe zones for screw placement and some atypical cases. So it should cover kind of a good breadth of uh, what you're gonna see in bread and butter total hip arthroplasty. So anatomy. So <clears throat> a couple of things, and I think you need to correlate the anatomy, for instance, to the x-ray. We tend to use, for instance, x-ray a little bit more often now, um, intraoperatively, um, such as anterior total hips, for instance. So we wanna see what we're seeing intraop in our field and kind of correlate with that, with the x-ray. So, uh, can see my marker here. So here's a pelvis and we're looking at it through almost a view that we would see in the, in the OR. So <clears throat> anterior superior iliac spine is right here. You have the anterior inferior iliac spine here. These are important landmarks um, for retractor placement, understanding where the screws go. When you look at the socket, you have the labrum, which you know, everyone knows the labrum, you got the cartilage, you have the ligamentum teres here, and the transverse acetabular ligament right across the bottom here. So you have the obturator frame in just below. Um, you certainly have to be aware of your obturator artery here. <clears throat> and the uh, rectus attachment over here at the anterior inferior lax spine, um, <clears throat> you'll have your greater sciatic notch and lesser sciatic notch down here, your ischium down here, and your pubic ramus uh, anteriorly here. So <clears throat> those are the landmarks you really want to be aware of. I think one important thing is to really understand uh, what exactly is the floor of the acetabulum. So this is the cotyloid fossa here at the base, <clears throat> and it really correlates on the x-ray to this lateral wall, the teardrop here. So this is the floor of the acetabulum here. It's a medial wall right here. And then you have the floor of the acetabulum right here, which is this lateral wall of the teardrop on the x-ray. So here you can see the iliopectineal and ileoischial lines. You have the teardrop right here, the acetabulum here. You have your anterior and posterior rims. But that when we talk about reaming medially to the floor, that's where this is important. We want to get to the, to the, <clears throat> to the bottom of this uh, teardrop right here. So. Um, just below this, then, <clears throat> is where your transverse acetabular ligament is, and you can get your tractors into the obturator foramen as well. Um, so that's, that's important to recognize um, and really understand what that means. Uh, the other thing is, in order to get fixation in press fit cups, which uh, many, many people use nowadays, is the anterior and posterior columns have to be intact. You have to be able to wedge something in between two spots in order to press fit it. So, you know, it has to be wedged between point A and point B. And so that's really your anterior and posterior column, uh, which is shown up here, your posterior column, your anterior column. 
Um, it's also important, you know, yes, you can wedge it, but we'll show later in this plastic cases, you may be missing some of this dome here. And your weight transfer occurs through the dome. <clears throat> and so you really need to make sure you have an intact dome here as well, or you need to recreate it with augments or different things like that. So important things to remember in anatomy, um, the colloid fossa correlates um, to the teardrop, and you want to know that that is the floor. So you'll take out that pulvinar on the bottom of that as the floor, and two columns you need in order to gain uh, press fit fixation, and then a dome for that support on top of the cup um, and for weight bearing. So this kind of brings it into retractor placement. So I think retractor placement, screw placement, you should really kind of think of similarly. Um, you know, it really has to do with safe zones, right? So if we want to understand the safe zones, we look at the anterior superior iliac spine. We take a line, go right through the middle of the acetabulum or the cup um, when we're putting screws in. <clears throat> and we draw a line 90 degrees or perpendicular to that. And we break them up into this posterior superior, posterior inferior, anterior superior, and anterior inferior quadrants. And the posterior superior quadrant <clears throat> is the safe zone. That's the safest spot where we put our screws. Um, there are still risks, and you can see the risks on this side. So uh, superior gluteal uh, vessels and nerve, uh, the sciatic nerve, uh, are somewhat at risk, uh, but much further away in the safe zone posterior superiorly uh, when you're going posterior inferiorly you the sciatic nerve is also at risk and inferior gluteal vessels as well um, you're aiming more towards the greater and lesser sciatic notches so that's understandable um, <clears throat> so that's why for instance in a posterior approach when you put screws in you can sometimes put your finger back here just make sure that screw's not too long or sticking out too far um, <clears throat> The iliac vessels are at risk in the anterior superior quadrant. Sometimes in revision cases, you do have to put screws in. You just got to make sure you feel the bone. Uh, <clears throat> and certainly, they're going to be shorter. Um, the anterior inferior obturator is at risk. Um, and so when you place those retractors, since you want to be a little cautious of that. Um, but when you take the pulvinar, for instance, out, you always usually see a little bleeder down there. And that's branch off the obturator, and you want to cauterize that. So these are the safe zones for screw placement. And similarly with retractors, um, you can place retractors in really any of these quadrants. Um, probably the most common ones tend to be a retractor in the obturator just below the TAL, just under the rectus, and just below the anterior superior iliac spine, kind of angling it right towards the anterior inferior iliac spine, or sorry, anterior superior iliac spine is kind of a good landmark when you're you're in the OR to angle it that way. But basically, right under the rectus, into your inferior leg spine, you can put a retractor here. You can put retractors all around the rim back here, but just don't want to dive too far in, <clears throat> especially uh, towards the uh, sciatic notches. So uh, sometimes you can use spiked retractors to kind of dig it into the bone here, um, and that can be helpful. Similarly, you can use spiked retractors into the, uh, into the ischium here, and that can help uh, with your retractor retraction as well. But bottom line, remember, bone's your friend, so you want to make sure you keep, stay on bone. So that's how what keeps you safe. Um, so now what do we do? So we got our retractor, we got our exposure. Now we got to remove all the soft tissues. We got to do our soft tissue debris. So here in an anatomic specimen, you can see the labrum, you can see the transverse tabular ligament, you can see the, <clears throat> although pulvinar is taken out, you can see the bottom and the floor of the acetabulum or the floor of the cotyledon fossa here. So we remove this labrum, remove the pulvinar, which allows us to see this. We cauterize the obturator branch down here, and then we can start reaming. So what do we actually start to ream at? Well, it depends on what you plan. Um, and so generally speaking, many women are around a 54 cup and many men are around a 56 cup, you know, plus or minus two for each one. And in this case, um, you want to generally start somewhere around five to eight sizes smaller. Everyone's a little different. Um, but when you start with your first reamer, so I'll typically start around a 47, you want to medialize to the floor of the acetabulum. So we were talking about floor right here. We want to go straight medial. <clears throat> so on a posterior approach, you're almost aiming straight to the floor or a lateral approach. When the patient's in a lateral position, you're going straight to the floor. 
on an anterior approach, you're going almost straight across 90 degrees, almost the other, the wall on the other side of the room or perpendicular to the sagittal axis of the patient. And you want to, you want to see some bone inside the reamer. You want to recognize that you have taken some of that bone and cartilage away and then evaluate it. And when we say, uh, go back there. Um, when we say that we're going to the floor, <clears throat> that means really the superior part right here, right? It's a three-dimensional structure. You're not trying to completely eliminate this <clears throat> entire um, fossa here, but as you ex as you medialize, it's this top part that's going to become more flush. Um, the inferior part isn't necessarily, and that's not what you're looking for. You might end up too medial if you try to make this completely flat. Um, and the other thing you want to see is you'll start to see these excoriations around uh, the rim to see that the reamer is actually actually working. And so you start to see that. Now you don't have to medialize all the way on the first reamer. You'll have more reamers to go and you want to give yourself a little leeway uh, so that you, when you're pushing medially in the other reamers, you're not going to uh, burn a bridge or go too far medial. So uh, when we uh, start off there, you know, the question is why are we medializing in the first place, right? So, well, Basically, there's a few different reasons. One is a lot of times the bone is somewhat sclerotic. And for that reason, some people will actually take out the osteophytes beforehand. Um, you might not see the floor of the acetabulum because there may be a medial osteophyte. There might be osteophytes along the rim or a calcified labrum. And you can certainly remove those ahead of time as well. Sometimes they'll try to kick your reamer one way or the other. If you're aware of them, you can kind of push into them and just recognize they're there. I don't typically remove them right away. Uh, uh, I sometimes find it helpful to put at least the first reamer in and kind of gives you sometimes a better view of the anatomy. Uh, <clears throat> but I, I will typically use the reamers and then take the ossifites on after. Uh, there are two different ways of doing it. You can take them out before or after. But um, one, the whole point being is when you medialize, you want to get into that sclerotic bone. So it allows you to then expand and get that good bleeding bed. You may find uh, as you're reaming, that you get to the size reamer that you wanted to finish on and you're thinking about putting the cup in, but then you know it just doesn't look right. It's not enough bleeding bone. And it's probably because you didn't quite spend enough time medializing a little bit and then expanding. Um, so then you wanna go back uh, down some reamers and really try to get into that scar bone or your rep didn't get you the, the freshest reamers and they're just dull. Um, so it can happen. Um, you know, you wanna look at those things. You just wanna need, need to get into it. Um, once you get into the sclerotic bone, <clears throat> the other thing that helps is really to get more coverage, right? So let's say you have dysplastic acetabulum, for instance, medialization is really helpful because you get, you, once you medialize, you get more coverage superiorly over that dome because that's where that weight transfer happens. Uh, the other reason is just biomechanical, and this uh, is diagram basically explaining, you know, so the different forces are acting on essentially a seesaw or a a lever arm, right? So the weight of the patient is down here. It's acting at this fulcrum. <clears throat> the forces of the abductors are acting in this direction, but this is the fulcrum on which they're acting. And if you imagine you leave the leg length and offset completely normal, you leave everything the same in the femur, but you just shift this point immediately. Now it has, the abductors have a longer lever arm, so they're more effective. They can put less force um, in order to enact a certain uh, a certain force across the hip. So if you have a smaller fulcrum, or sorry, larger uh, uh, larger arm here, arrow keeps going away, uh, a larger arm here, if you medialize it, you increase the lever arm of the abductors, so you actually put less stress across the hip. So that decreases your joint reactive force. So this gets a little confusing, um, for instance, you know, you think, okay, I'm putting less force across the hip. Doesn't that mean my hip is less stable? No, and that's where this, this helps to understand, okay, well, when we talk about leg length and offset, <clears throat> this is more of a static thing. I mean, it, it has dynamic implications, but this is, if you think of it more and more as a static thing, we're talking about tension in the muscles, right? So the static tension in the muscles is giving that stability to the hip. <clears throat> and um, that's what happens when we increase offset or increase leg length. We're increasing the tension across the muscles, and that tension helps stabilize the hip. Um, <clears throat> the 
joint reactive. Now, now certainly that does put more stress across it, but the joint reactive force is is different in that that means because we're like we were saying earlier even if we keep the leg length and offset the same if we shift that point medially now we're just putting less force across the hip joint itself even though leg length offset everything else is the same so stability wise everything's the same it's just that we are putting less stress across the hip uh, the socket so in the old days well not that long ago the older polyethylenes used to wear away quicker so that was important. We didn't want to put as less stress. That's less wear on the polyethylene. It's less stress across the cup itself. So that means it's less likely to, to, uh, yeah, to, to loosen. Um, <clears throat> so that's a reason why we want to medialize. The downside is, is bone loss, right? You're going to take a little bit more bone away. If you have a really young patient, you may not want to medialize all the way. You may want to try to preserve as much bone as you can um, just because you expect them to need a revision down the line. But you still need to medialize some. So that's the rationale um, behind medialization. Um, so now we medialize, now what do we do, right? So we have our reamers in. Um, now, a couple things to be aware of is, okay, what is the soft tissue doing to you? You wanna understand what is it, is it pushing your reamer one way or the other? So for instance, in a posterior approach, you're gonna, you're gonna be pushing all the tissues anteriorly and retracting them anteriorly, but those same anterior tissues are going to push you posteriorly. So you want to push against them. You want to push anteriorly and inferiorly to make sure that the tissues don't push you to, uh, into the posterior wall and you start reaming out the posterior wall. Similarly, anteriorly, you're retracting a lot of the tissues posteriorly, and so you don't want the tissues to push you uh, anteriorly and ream out the anterior wall. So you basically want to stay in the center. You don't want the tissues to push you one way or the other. Um, check the walls, right? So periodically you can check the walls, you can push on them. They really shouldn't be flexible. If they're starting to feel thin, a little flexible, they're getting a little thin. So make sure you start pushing uh, against those tissues and try to avoid uh, the tissues dictating your surgery. Uh, <clears throat> double check your retractors. A lot of times when you put the reamer in and out, you might, you might catch a retractor and it's not your, it's not your system's fault. It's, it is just really that, you know, it happens. And, um, <clears throat> you may need to replace your retractor and make sure they're in a good spot. Um, there's a good little rule, you know, especially in weak bone, for instance, uh, you know, older, older female patients, um, you put the reamer in for about three seconds, stop. That way you don't over, overdo anything. Take, you know, do three second spurts. So that way you can assess it and see, okay, does this feel okay? Can I go a little further and just kind of keep going like that? So doing little spurts like that, that can be helpful. So we wanna stay safe. So now um, we've re-immediately, what are we gonna do? Well, we gotta expand. So what does that mean really, right? So we've created this medial defect. We've essentially made it, and it's no longer, not a hemisphere, not that it was in the first place, but now we need to make it into a hemisphere. So you can see on this little diagram, you've medialized here and there's this kind of, ledge right here. So now we want to expand this so that we remove that ledge or remove that superior bone, <clears throat> that dome. And the way we do that is we go up the reamers and we try to expand it into a hemisphere. So usually I'll go up by twos um, and we stay on odd reamers because most of the cup sizes are, are even. And so we want to under ream by one. So if I was putting a 54, I'd ream to a 53 evaluate it, see if I like it, and then put a 54 cup in. That gives us a press fit by one. It gives us a little bit of tolerance in terms of reaming technique, bone quality, things like that to give us more of a press fit. Um, so when you expand, you also want to now bring the reamer, not straight medial. Now you want to put it where you anticipate the cup to be, right? So um, now you're, you're going to push a little bit medial, but you're also going to push more up uh, superiorly and, and medially as well. Uh, <clears throat> And you're going to drop your hand. You're going to drop your hand to bring it closer to where that cut position is going to be. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that part in a little second here. Um, it's helpful here as well to I keep my hand close to the tissue right on the handle so that I don't plunge. Um, and weak bone, for instance, that's really helpful. And it's kind of like, you know, spine or different surgeries that you're trying to use the patient's body to prevent you from plunging. So, uh, <clears throat> so here, um, 
you know, we we're just talking about bringing the reamer to the position that we want it to. So how do we know what position we want, right? So uh, there are a few different things. Generally, you know, we talk about Linux safe zones. So about 40 degrees abduction, 20 degrees antiversion. That's a simple, easy way to remember that. I will talk a little bit more about that and its relevance now. Um, but what you want to look at, um, the anatomic checks while you're reaming uh, to know that you're in a good position. So there are checks for antiversion. Um, one thing that I'll do is this is where that rectus attachment, a anterior inferior iliac spine is kind of put your finger right around this two o'clock position. If this is the 12 o'clock, this is about that two o'clock position. It's pretty much right where your finger will fit, honestly. And then that's about, that should be about flush. Uh, the, the reamer should be about flush with the rim here. Now, if you have some osteophyte here, you may want to take that into account or maybe take that out beforehand. If it comes out easily, it's osteophyte. If it doesn't, it's probably part of the wall. Um, so then it should be about flusher. That should give you about your uh, correct antiversion. And keep in mind your psoas comes out right there as well. And so if it's flush here, you're gonna you're gonna avoid that psoas impingement or psoas tendonitis. The other way to check is look at your transverse acetabular ligament. And with the reamer in place, you can actually see that fairly well and you can feel it. And uh, when you put the cup in as you're putting it in, because it's not seated all the way, it kind of blocks your view. Um, sometimes it's helpful to just draw a line on the patient. Um, and you want to be perpendicular to this, right? So you don't, you know, if my reamer is coming in like like this then it's not really perpendicular. I want that reamer coming in perpendicular like that, that handle, perpendicular to TAL. Those are checks to kind of match the anatomy. And you expect as you get closer to the expected size that a little bit of that reamer is gonna stick out, <clears throat> a little bit of that cup's gonna stick out posteriorly, and, and that's normal. So checks for abduction, uh, <clears throat> you know, look at where that reamer handle is. So relative to the floor, if you're the patient's in a lateral position relative to the floor, really the pelvis, the sagittal plane of the patient, it should be about 45 degrees, right? And then that's going to give you, and then you can, uh, you can drop that down a little bit, five degrees roughly. Um, the other thing is you can look just inside the TAL. So if you're uh, abductor appropriately, you, you'll see just a little bit of that TAL uh, just outside the cup. So your cup will sit just inside the TAL. On the x-ray, like we were talking about, um, the inferior cup is usually going to sit right at the bottom of the teardrop. Um, and so that can be a helpful landmark uh, to show how what that looks like. Um, actually, I think I have, uh, so if you look at this, for instance, you can see this inferior bottom, bottom part of the cup is right about that teardrop level. And even if you had to reams superiorly, for instance, if you're doing a high up center dysplastic cup or something, if you draw a line across here, across that ellipse of the cup uh, face, it, it'll essentially usually be about collinear uh, with the bottom of the teardrop. And so it gives you or at least a, kind of a parallel plane. So that kind of gives me a good guide, for instance, on anterior hips is to quickly know what my version is um, on, or sorry, what my abduction angle is. So those are some good landmarks uh, for abduction and aversion. Those are anatomic landmarks. I found them really helpful over my last eight years in practice. They've been, you know, very, very, I think, in a sense, patient specific. So I think they've worked really well. Um, <clears throat> you can also ream under x-ray, right? Ream under x-ray, see if you like it. If you don't like it, adjust it. Um, if you're not sure where you are, take an x-ray. Um, you can put the guide on the reamer as well. There's some guides that we'll talk about here in a little bit. So... <clears throat> So we're, we've expanded, we've put our reamer into that position that we want it to be in. And a couple of other things you want to be aware of, don't, don't hurt yourself, right? So in sclerotic bone, it's going to catch. So you'll, you might twist your wrist, you might injure your wrist or elbow. So you want to be careful with that. So a couple of things you can do is put your, re, put your body or torso at first in between the reamer handle and the patient body so that you can use your body to prevent that torque. Um, and start the reamer a little off bone. Don't start it right next to that sclerotic bone. It'll catch and it'll twist your wrist. So just be careful, protect yourself, um, be cognizant of that. You know, ergonomics are important, especially when you're doing joint replacements. Um, as one of my partners used to say uh, in Nebraska, that you know it's a, a marathon, not a sprint. So um, these are just some helpful things there, just to keep you safe. So now that we've expanded, right? How do we know when we're done, right? What what point are we finished? So there's a few different things you want to look for. So we've medialized, we've expanded. 
we want the bone to grow into the implant. So how does the bone grow into it? We need some bleeding bone, right? So generally you want about 80% of the bone that you see to be uh, have some punctate bleeding. What does that really mean, right? So everyone says that, but what does that really mean? Um, so sclerotic bone doesn't ble doesn't bleed, right? Where are the blood vessels? The blood vessels are on the subchondral bone and, and below, right? So if you don't see bleeding bone, then it's still a sclerotic bone. If you start to see some punctate bleeding, then that is the subchondral bone. I usually will wait, you know, you can suction it out. You can put a lap in, dry it up, pull it out. You wait a couple seconds, you know, I just, it's a good thing about three seconds and a lot of things, threes, rules of threes for a lot of sports, everything. Um, you see some bleeding bone, that you, you should be fine. Now, <clears throat> just because the bone is hard, right? You're not necessarily, you're not looking for cancellous bone, just because the bone is hard doesn't mean that, that it's sclerotic, right? So the sub subchondral bone is a strong plate of bone. And, um, but so it, it is still hard, but it's not the sclerotic bone. Once you pass the sclerotic bone, you'll see that bleeding subchondral bone. It's still a very supportive bone. Now you can go a little further down. You can get into the deeper layers of subchondral bone. And if you really need more coverage, you get into more of the cancellous bone. But <clears throat> the, the most important thing is that you're in some a good bleeding bed and supportive bone. So um, that's what you want to look for. You want to look for that 80% about punctate bleeding. You dry it up, wait about three seconds, it's bleeding. You'll recognize that. Um, recognize that sclerotic bone will not bleed, subchondral bone will. And so that's how you know that you're in the right spot. Um, you only need about 40, you know, try and say so about 40 to 50% of that to really grow in. And these things are pretty forgiving, right? So the the uh, the ingrowth surfaces on the cups are are really advanced now, and I think they're they're very forgiving. Um, so you know, but you want to get as much um, as much contact with the bone as possible, and as much bleeding bone in contact with the, with the cup as possible. So um, it's if you really have to. I mean, the most important area yes is at the dome. That's where the weight bearing is. That's where you want it to ingrow. Um, so that's a very critical area to make sure you're bleeding. And that's why when we're expanding after we medialize, that's a really good area to check. Check the dome, make sure that the dome is has that bleeding bed, um, that posterior superior area where you're going to put those screws. What I like to do and when I get close to the reamer is also put the reamer in and kind of move it a little bit. It should grab. It should a lot of times, maybe not all the time, but a lot of times it'll kind of grab. It'll it'll almost feel like a trial. I don't typically trial, but I use essentially the reamer, the last reamer, expect reamer to feel like about a trial. And if it grabs a little bit, it tells me that I'm getting close to that point. Um, and, and then I should get a good press fit on the actual reamer or on the actual cup. So how far do you ream? As we talked a little bit earlier, I, you can ream under ream by one or line to line. Um, a lot of people under ream by one, you can, um, in weaker bone, ream line to line um, because you expect the bone to be more <clears throat> uh, viscoelastic. It's going to expand a little bit. And so you want to be able to have that press fit. And so if the bone's really weak, you, you need to accommodate for that. Most of the time, though, under ream by one works very well. It accounts for any asymmetry in reaming technique. It accounts for the weaker bone um, and, and gives you a really good press fit. In Revision settings, um, you know, that can be different uh, in a more uh, revision type of cup. Sometimes you may need to ream line to line, or if it's not quite getting down, you may need to touch it with that. Uh, say if you're putting a 54 cup, you need to touch it with a 54 reamer. So, so now that we're done, now we got to, now we got to, you may need to fine tune it. What if you don't like it, right? So these are some helpful kind of concepts. So I kind of made up, but they're, um, you know, you want to avoid creating an egg, right? So if you think about an egg, it's it's not hemispherical, right? You're, you're creating a, a deeper point in the sock, you're over medializing. So if you over medialize, you've created this uh, apex in the socket and you don't want to do that, right? So how do you avoid doing that? Well, it goes back to the expanding, right? So you're expanding that into hemisphere. So if that's the apex, now you need to expand that. So you have the, the reamer head in here, you want to rotate it like this to really expand the rim of the socket 
to get it more hemispherical and then go up the size reamer until it, it fits symmetrically. So that's where I have this top here. I, I think of it as kind of spinning a top around the tip, um, around that reamer axis to try and get that rim, expand that rim, and then get that hemispherical uh, cut. So <clears throat> the other way, another technique of doing that, uh, kind of combined with it, is if the, if the I'm gonna exaggerate here, but the rim is tight here and you really deepen this here, you want to expand this introitus or the entry point of that. So the way you do that is you can just go in a little bit and, and kind of out a little bit to expand the introitus or expand that, that opening of the acetabulum. So there are two different techniques to try and make that hemisphere. The other part is sometimes that rim up top is really sclerotic. That superior dome is literally sclerotic and it looks flatter. And, and you'll see that it looks a little flatter. Maybe your cup's not sitting down all the way. And if the cup's not sitting down all the way, that's something you want to look for. Both of the, all, all, both of these things. So if it's more of a flat top, a flatter dome, you want to ream up and in. So you want to take that, go back to the reamer, take that reamer and go up and in, push superiorly and go medially, kind of uh, towards, not straight medially, right? You're going to push up towards the dome basically to get that in there, in the position you expect your cup to be. Um, the other part is you, maybe you don't like it. You don't have enough leaking bone. And this happens from time to time. If you don't like it, just go downsize, start over. It's frustrating that you, you can get into that bleeding bone and get a better bed for um, bony ingrowth. So make it a hemisphere. If it doesn't look like it, ream where it doesn't look like a hemisphere. So, so then you trial. I said, I don't trial. I use a reamer as trial. And then you want to implant, right? So <clears throat> irrigate it, check your bone, make sure there's no bony debris, no leftover pulvinar or labrum, anything that might have even uh, fall in or sometimes you'll you'll notice a little bit of labrum or something that you missed or a little bit of uh, pulvinar or maybe the TAL is starting to get in the way you can thin out the TAL you can take a little rim of that TAL um, you don't need to take the whole thing but take a little bit of it out um, <clears throat> so then you impact the cut and you want to place your screws posterior superiorly right so that's where you want them to be and if I go back to, to um, <clears throat> To here, I like to think of where those screws go. I, I tend to put, if you draw an ASI stick, draw that line straight to the middle, my anterior screw I'll usually have right abutting that line. And that gives me some options um, if I need to put additional screws uh, across the posterior superior quadrant. So I think that's a helpful uh, landmark there. So, uh, <clears throat> and then you want to check if you're down, right? So you can check on the x ray, see if you're down. Uh, place a schnitt or freer, um, something in in the holes and screw holes to make sure that the cup is actually seated down to the bone and and make sure you got the press fit. So I like to shake the pelvis a little bit. So the the socket, if it's you have great press fit, it should move that pelvis without any motion of the cup itself. And be careful sometimes if the handle loosens, you might notice the handle loosen, be aware of that. Just tighten the handle and just make sure that that cup is moving the pelvis. So if it's not, if you're not getting good press fit, what do you do? Well, remove the implant, check for any inter, interposition bone, soft tissue, what have you. Um, and like we talked about previously, is it not fitting because it's getting tight on the rim, uh, meaning it's not spherical? Or is it just that maybe it's a little loose? Maybe the bone expanded a little bit too much um, as you put it in because it was too weak. Or maybe you just, the reaming technique, it was a little looser and you didn't quite get that press fit because there's um, <clears throat> it, it's uh, you essentially reamed a little wider than what the press fit would allow. So if that's the case, then there are two different techniques, right? So if it's aspherical, just ream the introitus like we talked about. Um, <clears throat> go ahead and do the spinning top to try and ream the the perimeter of the of the socket and expand that so that you can get it more spherical. Um, if it's just a little bit off, sometimes just touching that last reamer a little bit can be helpful. And if it's loose, you may just need to upsize it. You may just need to accept that, hey, this I may have reamed a little bit too much, and maybe I just need to upsize it. Um, sometimes the other option is to take a revision cut, which is a little thicker, um, thicker ingrowth surface on the back. And so that uh, can be a, another you know, bailout option in that case. Uh, it has more press fit, and so it makes up for that. So a few different things that you can do if it's not quite the price fit, but you want to make sure you work for that.
So a few other helpful tools um, for a posterior approach or an anterior lateral approach, you can use this when the patient's in lateral position. You can still use an anterior approach too, but this guide attaches to your impactor or your reamer and the A component, you want to be perpendicular, for instance, on when the patient's in the lateral position, you want it perpendicular to the floor and that should give you your 40 degrees of abduction, right? So um, uh, you can dial it down, 45, and you can dial it down just a little bit um, to get that 40. The A are these cross hairs over here, the B, one is for left and one is for right, so make sure you're, you're looking at the correct one, but you want that parallel to the, to the back of the patient, so the axis of the patient. Um, you know, if the patient has some spinal deformity and they're, they're flexed forward, you know, be aware of that. Uh, <clears throat> then it, you may not want that. Um, those are, are a good rough guide as well in combination with the other anatomic landmarks we were discussing. So that's helpful. And of course, there's robotics, computer assisted, different technologies that various companies have and uh, are all fantastic um, and really help you in being as accurate as possible. So that can be very helpful. Um, the, uh, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all great tools. Um, they'll give you visual um, cues about exactly where you are. Um, so those are all different techniques. And um, so a few other things is, well, we always talk about the 40-20. So Luminix safe zones, you know, these are, these are safe zones that have been around for quite some time. They're very helpful, I think, as a really general guide but they're really not as accurate or they're not as predictive of instability as I think we gave credence to previously. And I think that's been well studied, various studies. This is an example of one study. This is a study at Mayo Clinic, 9,784 patients. And these are fellowship trained joint surgeons. Uh, of these cases, they had 2% dislocate. There are 206 dislocations. There are different approaches. But if you look at the scatter plot on the right side, you can see in the box is the, the ones that are in the safe zone. The posterior approaches are the blue circles and the anterolateral approaches are the red X's. All of these are in, that are in the box are in the Lunex safe zone, but they still dislocated, right? So that's 58%, I think of all of, yeah, 58% of all of them, I didn't write that on there, but 58% of all of them in this study were in the safe zone. So these are all the hips that dislocated. 58% of those were still were in the safe zone for, for the socket. So. Of the posterior approaches, 65% were in the safe zone. Of the anterolateral approaches, 33% were in the safe zone. But the odds for dislocation were significantly higher for a posterior approach than an anterior lateral approach, even though 65% of the posterior approaches uh, were in the, in the uh, safe zone. So I think while it's a helpful guide, it certainly doesn't tell us the whole picture. There's so many things that affect stability. And I think, it, you know, I think in general, society tends to oversimplify things. And while it can be helpful, um, you know, it's not just one single thing. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of things, spine deformity, pelvic tilt, the tissues can be a little lax, the patient's range of motion might be more, they might have avascular necrosis and those patients have a little higher risk, for instance, of dislocation. Um, the patient's just, you know, activities may be the type that are more apt to dislocate. Maybe they're, they're just in uh, more uh, compromising positions. Um, you know, certain patients may not follow restrictions. I think it's, uh, you know, a posterior approach when we do those approaches, the, the position in which it dislocates is oftentimes more often a functional position. And so, um, whereas anterior approaches tend not to dislocate in more functional positions. Um, so I think that might be part of that, you know, not advocating one or the other, but I think a well done total hip is a good total hip regardless. But um, their point being is there's so many other reasons why I think patients dislocate. And then that's why I really trust the anatomy more than anything else. I'm gonna put it where the anatomy says, and that's been good for me. Um, you know, also the femoral component position, you know, you may have some femoral dysplasia, may force you into some aneversion or, or so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, there may be some impingement or, you know, light length offset issues. None of those are typically discussed in a lot of these studies. Patient comorbidities, any neurologic disorder certainly increases your risk of, of dislocation. Um, so there's quite a few different things um, that may contribute more than just cup position, but it's still, I think, a really helpful overall guide of where you want to put the cup in combination with the anatomic landmarks. So I think with robotics and navigation, that's where I think you got to be careful with that is, 
you know, it, it targets the numbers, I think, more so, um, which is fine. Um, but we don't really know what the target really should be for every patient. And so that's a little challenging. You know, there's some three dimensional things uh, that different companies have in terms of understanding um, predictive uh, impingement. But of course, that doesn't take into account the soft tissues. You can take a CT scan and evaluate, OK, if I put the cups here, so on and so forth, where is it going to impinge? But, you know, a patient may have a bigger thigh. And I think, for instance, these big patients sometimes can impinge on their own thighs. Um, so there's different factors that come into play. So, um, but we still wanna get the cup as a good position as possible. Um, so just to finish off with a few different kind of unusual cases um, or, you know, things that you, how to deal with. So Pertrugio, so there's a difference between coxid profunda, Pertrugio acetabuli. The, the floor of the acetabulum is medial to the ilioischial line, Kohler's line right here. Um, and if the head, uh, proceeds medial to that as well, then, then that is um, uh, Pertugio. Uh, so the, in this case, the, you really don't need to medialize, right? Because it's already so medial. So, so it's a different, you have to think about it a little differently. So <clears throat> you still want a good bed of bleeding bone. Um, in this case, there's a few different ways you can manage it. Um, we were talking about the uh, reaming the rim essentially. So this is where we talked about, for instance, a rim fit could be an option where uh, you don't want to ream too far immediately. You put your hand close to the patient right on that reamer handle so you don't plunge immediately. You still wanna get as much bleeding bone throughout that whole surface as possible, but now you're dealing with some offset issues that you may need to reconstruct. So if you have a good bed medially um, <clears throat> without going through, and frankly, even if you go through most of the time, it's a, it's a contained defect and, and it's, um, it's going to be fine. So, you know, as long as you have some bleeding bed there, if you really want to lateralize the hip again or lateralize the socket, there's a couple of different ways. You can put some bone graft there, ream it on reverse so that it doesn't take away bone, but compresses that down and then put your cup in if essentially getting a rim fit and put your screws in. Um, the other option is a lateralized liner. You can put your cup in and then put a lateralized liner as well. So a few different options of dealing with that, but the same fundamentals, it's just that you don't need to medialize to the same degree. You need to primarily focus on expanding and getting a good bleeding bed um, <clears throat> and then deciding how you're going to regain your offset, whether you're going to use a lateralized cup, a lateralized liner, you're going to put some bone graft, uh, reverse ream, and then put a cup and, and, and then put the screws in. But a few different options, all of them are, are reasonable techniques and you know, certainly depend on the situation. Uh, so like hip dysplasia, you know, both of these are just, you know, talks in themselves, but, uh, you know, crow classification um, shown at the top, 25, uh, less than 25, 25, 50, 75, and 100% uh, <clears throat> uh, translation of the femoral head. So this some example, you know, dysplasia can be of the acetabulum and the femur and, you know, one or the other um, and, or both. And oftentimes they're associated with some significant deformities that you have to consider, and it's helpful to have some different options. So the socket, the acetabulum, whereas a lot of times, you know, in typical osteoarthritis, you're going to see more posterior lateral wear, you're going to see more anterior lateral wear and acetabular deficiency on a, on a dysplastic case, and they may have some abnormal antiversion, um, you know, as opposed to like a, a pincer hip, you may have some, you may have some more retroversion. Um, the a femur is also going to have more dysplastic characteristics, more antiversion, a uh, little posterior greater trochanter, a valgus neck, um, you know, hypoplastic canal, all these things um, listed down there. So with this, different techniques are available to us. Um, but this goes back to, we talked about having two columns to press fit the cup into, and you need that dome, you need that superior bony support. So um, that second part of it is where this comes into play is you need to create that bony support. So even though you can get a press fit on the cup, not really need to get that superior dome support. This is just going to toggle and it's going to loosen. So there's some different ways of doing that. Um, a classic way of doing that is to take the femoral head and kind of bolt it onto the cup, which is shown in the center here. Um, you can bolt it onto the socket here and essentially use that femoral head as bone graft to recreate the dome. In similar fashion, you can use augments, which are metal uh, augments that do exactly the same thing. Um, the downside is 
both of these may not incorporate or may resorb. Well, I mean, the bone graft here or will loosen uh, over time and sometimes aren't as reliable. So uh, they're great options, but um, there are some other options as well. Uh, a couple of the uh, other options, for instance, are a higher hip center. You can accept it. You know, all their tissues have been shortened for a longer time. Um, you don't have to deal with doing a femoral osteotomy to shorten that up. Uh, <clears throat> the soft tissue tension is, is appropriate. Now, leg lengths is certainly still going to be an issue, um, but a high hip center is certainly a viable option. The other thing is a jumbo cup, which you can do that to a certain degree, and it's a helpful tool to have. And some cups in different companies have some, uh, it's not quite a double bubble cup, but have a superior extension essentially built in augment. Um, <clears throat> and the, uh, this just allows you to expand. And it, personally, I try to use a jumbo cup when possible, just because the cups are so reliable nowadays. And if they, uh, if you can get a good solid, large cup in, I think it tends to, it tends to last longer and, and, and do better. So there's some some examples of different cases that you can you can do, but yeah, I think um, you know this just a you know to summarize everything. I mean, I think it's very important to uh, recognize the anatomy here. Um, always be aware of where you are, where your retractors are, are being placed. Understand where that cotyloid fossa means and what we're talking about when we medialize. Why do we medialize in order to decrease the joint reactive forces and put less stress on the cut? Um, hopefully let the cup last longer. The poly isn't so much the issue anymore. Uh, <clears throat> and understand that after you medialize, you're really trying to expand, um, uh, expand that cup and allow it to create a hemisphere. And understand that you're going to be able to, you want to create a good bleeding bone and, you know, wait three seconds, see about that punctate bleeding. You want about 80% of it to be bleeding. You need at least, you want to get as much contact as possible. Um, just because it's hard doesn't mean that's a sclerotic bone, um, but it's okay. It's okay to get in deeper, but primarily focus on that punctate bleeding. That's how you know you're in the subcondyl bone. Um, use that reamer to give you a judge of if you're in that bone, if, if that's the correct size, see if it gets you that bite or moves the pelvis a little bit. It may not be perfect, but it'll give you a sense if it catches. Um, if it's asymmetric, fix it. So if it's too deep, ream the introitus, make it wider. Um, don't go medial, just expand it. Uh, <clears throat> spin it around like that top. Avoid that flat top. So if you got to go up and in. So um, just like this diagram, don't go medial here like you're angling this way. You're angling this way, up and in. That's how we ream the flat top or the dome if it's sclerotic here to recreate that um, and get rid of that sclerotic bone so you can prevent it from seating your cup all the way. Um, or prevent it from blocking your cup from seating all the way. Um, protect yourself, of course. Make sure to protect yourself. Don't forget, you know, you, you can get lost in the surgery sometimes and forget about your taking care of yourself too. Um, <clears throat> use all your anatomic landmarks for cup positioning. Feel the rim. Uh, feel the anterior inferior iliac, or you may not really feel the anterior inferior iliac spine, but you can feel the rectus about that two o'clock position on that right hip. That should be about flush. So then you know your antiversion is about appropriate. Use that transverse as tab ligament, use the x-ray, um, and um, use your the guide uh, as well. And all that will be really helpful. Um, just recognize um, that you know these are good guides, but I think anatomy is really, I think, your best, best bet. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So any questions at all? Thank you, Pinak, for that brilliant talk. Sure, and, uh, absolutely. A lot of people are watching the talk and because it's full of really practical, useful tips. And I like the way you present at the end that you did a quick review of what you spoke because that's oh, also okay. going to be very important. Yeah, that's, um, I'm glad. <laughs> I try to make it as practical. I mean, I think, try to think about what things as a resident confused me or, you know, I didn't quite get until I got into practice, I think, or, you know, you, you hear it, but you never quite get it you know <laughs> been a couple of questions uh now when we talk about screw placement most of the screw placement is superior right so uh -huh. are there situations where you have relied into a ischial screws something called as a kickstand screws especially if you're looking if you've not had enough of contact between your cup and the acetabulum if there are defects uh -huh. yeah absolutely um so 
<clears throat> on uh, if I go back to that slide, I, the you know most of the time it's in revision cases. So um, if you're doing a revision cup here and you want to get as many screws, well, you want to get you want to check your press fit. So if you have a decent press fit, you may not need as many screws. If you have uh, <clears throat> you know a, a okay press fit, you may want a little bit more screws. So one thing like you talk about the kickstand screw is very helpful is to get superior and inferior fixation. So judging where those screw holes are, I, I, in those cases, I'll kind of mark the, um, the, the issue down here and just kind of make sure I can see that. So I can see where that screw hole is so I can place it there, make sure I have, you know, in those cases, certainly it's a multi-hole cup. And so I'll try to put my screws superiorly and make sure I can line something up inferiorly. It doesn't always work, you know, to get it straight down the pike. When it does, it's beautiful. But <laughs> it, you know, the idea behind that is you don't want to hang your cup on the dome, right? Because you want your ingrowth on the dome for sure. But if you hang it on the dome, that means you don't get as much fixation down inferiorly. And a lot of times that's where you're missing some bone. And so if you're missing that bone in revision cases and your, your best bone is up uh, superiorly, um, if that's your only fixation, then it is essentially hanging and it can toggle and it has a higher risk of loosening. So in that case, it's helpful to line up your screw holes into the ischium and get an ischial screw, um, whatever you can, um, down the pike. And you can even do that to the synthesis, uh, I mean, to the, uh, uh, to the superior ramus as well. It's just that you have one more bone to work with on the ischium uh, to try and get some of the ischial screws. And you can also try to get uh, post your screws as well. And you're going to try really all the quadrants, wherever you can get the screw, um, being careful with your drill. But that's helpful because then there's less risk of it toggling. You can get some inferior growth. But yeah, that's a really helpful thing in revision cases, um, for sure. Thank you, Benak, for that. And uh, what about the use of hydrogen peroxide to the, uh, I mean, to the floor so that you get a completely dry bone. Suppose you're doing a cemented hip uh, replacement. Are you a cemented or an uncemented guy? Uh, so I use uncemented. Um, there are rare cases where where I will cement something, but I mean, usually that's like in an uh, um, you know on a uh, two stage revision or something. I'll, I'll cement in a poly or something like that, but usually not a cemented cup. Um, the I I don't have any experience with peroxide to cement. Um, that being most of my experience is more impressed it. Um, but you know I can understand that 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 would make sense. You know certainly to get rid of as much bone as or blood as possible, keep the bone dry. Um, you know I will cement a stem every every now and then, but usually that's more on hemis if I, if I need to. Um, still tend to press fit that a little bit more often, but. Um, yeah, I don't have any experience with peroxide, but I think that that would certainly make sense. Uh, you know, you just want to keep that bone as dry as possible. Um, and I'll, you know, use the last button to just really irrigate, make sure the blood pressure is low, you know, or, you know, low enough uh, to make sure maps 70 or less. And um, yeah, you just want to get, make sure it says bone as dry as possible, make sure that, uh, keep it dry, you know, keep that sponge in there, keep that suction in there I would, before you know, just before you're ready to cement and then just make sure that you can get that cemented right away. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly don't have very much experience cementing um, cups in for total hips. But interestingly enough, the longest total hip I've ever seen um, that I revised was in for about 43 years and it was a cemented cup and it was vertical, right? So I couldn't, I was, it was incredible, right? And so I, of course I ended up revising it and sir did end up loosening and the femur was loose, but yeah, I mean, 43 years for a cemented cup that was vertical, just goes to just show you how little we probably really know sometimes. <laughs> Thank you for, That's for that. Problem. And uh, you've shown an image of an intraoperative uh, image intensifier. Do you always use a image intensifier for your acetabular? I probably do 90, I don't know, probably 95% of the cases anteriorly. Um, so I'll usually will have uh, an Im image intensifier. If for some reason body habitus or they have more of a champagne flute pelvis, uh, you know, really decrease offset. And I think I might, or, or really a flesh contracture of the hip, you know, more than about 10, 15 degrees, then, then I will go anterolateral. So then, then I'll typically go 
you know, mini Watson, uh, Watts, I mean, uh, uh, modified Harding um, approach. So in that case, um, I typically don't use the x-ray. It's a little more, it's a little harder to get a good quality x-ray in that position. Um, but I will use it when I'm going anteriorly. So I do find that helpful, but to be honest with you, I tend to trust my anatomic landmarks and use the x-ray as a verification step because there are still so many aspects to this CR to make a perfect x-ray, um, whether it's leg lengths or cup position that, you know, sometimes I'll find myself, if, if I adjust something on the x-ray, I'm like, ah, I'm, not, I'm not convinced. And then I realize, you know, maybe that wasn't the right, right move. And so um, I trust the anatomy more than anything else. Uh, that's, that, I just use x-ray as a double checker. So. Thank you, Benak, for that. Just one last question before we wind up the session. Now, you've, yep. you've shown a picture of a dysplastic uh, scenario where you've used, uh, I mean, a jumbo cup as well. So how do you decide uh, whether you're going to accept a high hip center or a normal anatomical hip center? What is the crucial process by which you make that particular decision? So I think that, you know, crow one and two, it's very easy to, to do a jumbo cup. I think as you get to crow three, I think that's where I am, you know, that then I, I'm more willing uh, to accept a more higher hip center. I think crow four, um, you know, three to four is where, where I really start debating um, what the best solution is. I, I think in those cases, the, the jumbo cup is, it, it's, you end up having to go so big and you have to utilize so far uh, to get, to get enough coverage. Um, that I think in those cases, it's helpful to preserve bone and try to either keep a higher hip center uh, <clears throat> or try to use uh, an augment and, you know, if you need to an osteotomy, but, you know, the osteotomies aren't benign either, right? You're asking them to heal these um, osteotomies as well. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's a little more, uh, you know, certainly a little more technical and it's not that you can't do it, but, um, you're essentially using the osteotomy to take that tension back off the tissues as well. And so I, I think it's helpful to, um, to use a little more higher hip center and a three or four, if you really had to, as opposed to a jumbo cup, but one and two, I think a jumbo cup is a good solution. Uh, I think patients still recover and there's plenty of data out there that high hip centers still recover very well after these, uh, pro three, four dysplastic cases. Um, and so I, I think that has worked pretty well for me. I, I don't think that, um, uh, you know, I think the amount of bone loss that you in, end up having in, in a uh, crow three or four sometimes is, is doesn't work so well with the jumbo cup, though. So, and I think in that case, the higher center helps. And if you look at both these X-rays, do you think there's a difference between the longevity of the blood? For example, you have a jumbo cup on the right side, and you have a normal hip. I mean, a relatively normal size acetabulum. And yeah. so, do you think the longevity really affects? I, I find. I mean, I think from the, Comparing these two, I think the longevity is fairly similar, at least in my experience. But in terms of uh, as to have your augments, those tend to toggle and tend to loosen up in about three years or so. And so um, those augments, I, I don't trust as much. They're really fun to put in. They're, they're really neat. Um, they're great tools to have when you're trying to reconstruct something you can't find where you're going to get that coverage. But um, they're just they, you know, you're, you're trying to cement in between the implants. There's not really, uh, other than that, there's not really true contact. Um, so the support is there. You're relying on that ingrowth on essentially you're hanging the augment up. You're compressing with those compression screws. A lot of times the bone's weaker too. And so I, I think they tend to toggle a little bit more, you know, and, and for that reason, I think that they are not, um, they tend to loosen more. Whereas in these cases, you're getting more of a uh, full bony contract, uh, contact with a unitized construct. And you're, in the other ones, you're trying to unitize it with cement. And I, did, I think this is just more effective um, as one jumbo cup or a higher hip center. Thank you. Jumbo. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Pinak. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Fantastic lecture. And I'm sure this lecture is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you. Happy, uh, happy to be able to do that today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. You've been helpful.